and all the stories I've had the pleasure to tell you about over the years, they've always been from places so impossibly far away from me. People, bands, and businesses that if they ever mess around with my part of the world, it would only be indirectly. The major place in the phonographic world of the U.S. was, of course, New York and surrounding areas. Victor, Columbia, Decca Edison, American Record Corporation, OK. And then a little farther away, you had Massachusetts with the Grey Gall Corporation, and then Washington, D.C. with the birthplace of what would become the 78 with Berliner. The Midwest areas of Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Wisconsin having Janet, Autograph, Meteor, Paramount, and plenty of others. Down below them, despite New Orleans being crucial to the creation of jazz, there appears to be almost no labels from Louisiana predating Crescent in the 40s. Most of the recordings of the Gulf were done in Texas by New York area labels and not until the late 40s making their own stuff such as Peacock, Lucky 7, and Gold Star. The West Coast having some ventures such as Viola, Nordscog, Sunset, and a few studio locations in the 20s, but didn't really make it off the ground until Capital was made in the early 40s, and then California rivaled New York afterwards. There were other places too that had their own true labels, sure. But Southlanders like me didn't really have much to identify with. But there was at least one label that existed for us. Right here in my hometown of St. Petersburg, Florida. Sunshine Records. It's solely because of the location that it caught my eye. Its story is rich with culture, uniquity, insight, and to my knowledge, apart from some locals that mention it, scarcely any other 78ers know of this label. Those who do probably think there'd be no story, but there's surprisingly a lot. So let's start in December of 1924. The General Phonograph Corporation, which owned Odeon and OK, had done quite well for themselves by the end of the year. Their top artist, Vincent Lopez, which was their main focus of the dance band ventures for the label by December. By this point, they were very busy, rushing around to keep up with the holiday sales opportunities. Part of this included making a special delivery pouch and display case for needles, preparing for a staff change, and getting new distributors. Though they were there before, it was in 1924 that OK really started to hone in on what the South really had to offer, Georgia specifically. They had James K. Polk Inc. in Atlanta, which was their largest distributor of their product, as well as Sonora brand stuff and phonographs. OK had started recording a large amount of records in Atlanta by now, mostly folk, country, and jazz. Artists wax included Viola Baker, Fiddlin' John Carson, Edward Andrews, Warner's Seven Aces, Bill Patterson, Lan Norris, Annie Summerford, and the Seminole Syncopators. Many of these records were featured come October for the 1924 Southeastern Fair in Atlanta. The month-long fair in Atlanta had its own review, auto races, and livestock exhibits among others. It was a huge deal. Reportedly 500,000 people showed up during this time, a bigger number at the time considering the state's population was under 3 million. Many of these people doubtlessly saw Polk's own exhibit for OK, Odeon, and Sonora Records, along with outing modeled phonographs. Concerts were given by local OK artists there, creating a demand by onlookers for their releases. Both OK and Sonora saw success due to this. Naturally from a success like this, the question of, well, what other remote artists could be popular arises. Well, OK had decided to record a bit in Dallas by December, but there's still the South itself they could continue exploring. They had already established Georgia had a lot to offer. They had recorded a bit in March down in Louisiana. Victor had messed around with South Carolina years back, North Carolina not so much. Further west with Alabama and Mississippi, both of which were mostly untouched, but what about deeper into the South? Perhaps the thoughts of Otto Heinemann, general president and founder, went along the lines of, if Georgia gives us this much success, then going deeper south into Florida may give us more success as well. But maybe OK had been looking into Florida for a while now. Florida had been going through a boom in tourism and general industrial boom for a while now. Many of the executives, owners, and other top music industry men vacationed down here. A good example was Thomas Edison, who annually vacationed down here. His winter home in Fort Myers is a tourist attraction these days. About the biggest part of the music industry down in Florida at the time, 
Apart from a songwriting firm, Theaters in a Ballroom was the distributors and wholesalers that carried records and phonos. Be it a chain department store, single location or otherwise, it's where most in one's local area would have bought a machine or records from a certain brand. Polk handled OK and Sonora material for Florida, so there would be a market readily available if they decided to cater to Floridians. But there was also a public interest in the state growing. Songs were being written and recorded around this time about Florida, and they were seen in the wild, exotic, and wondrous place. Dance songs such as Fair Florida, Miami, Jacksonville Gal, In Miami, Pensacola Blues, While Miami Dreams, Tampa Bay You're Calling Me, Tallahassee, even the Sybil Sanderson Suite entitled A Day in Florida Woodland, and plenty of others were being made. Pseudonymously, Miami and Florida got put onto various dance band sessions too. Florida was essentially an untapped phonographic market, rich with attention-grabbing opportunities waiting to be discovered for a label if they looked. Either way, OK decided upon the state, searching for talent and an area to do field recording. In theory, they had four realistic options for doing this. One, they could get some of their studio personnel and travel down to a random city of choice in Florida along with a recording crew and record them in a hall, theater, or space and work with local talent. Two, they could look for one of their established artists or available artists in the area and talk them into doing it. Three, they could ask around for what bands or singers were coming out of the Florida area and go to where they usually perform at and make recording sessions for them with an OK recording crew. Or four, look to one of the best up-and-coming cities in Florida and cater to their audiences and talent recording there. It seems they took either option three or four. As for truly local talent, it's likely they were looking for another jazz band at first. OK's top orchestra leader right now is Vincent Lopez. There was competitions about him, poetry, and having his name at the top of OK advertising was seen throughout the end of 1924. One of his best-selling records by this point was I Want to Be Happy. Florida had her fair share of options available. True, this was before the time of Ross Deluxe Syncopators and Blue Steel's Orchestra, both of which would cement themselves in the Florida area by 1926, but there was Earl Gresh, formerly of his Kentucky Colonels, that was leading a band at the Coliseum in St. Petersburg, which was filled with sidemen from bands such as Jan Garber's, Julius Fisher's, and Mark Goff's orchestras. Another choice was Cecil Carbonell and his Miamians that played in, you guessed it, Miami, and doing quite well for himself. Another still was the Collins Jazz Orchestra of Tampa Bay, which was led by Roy Gilbert and played in Central Florida, proving to be very popular during this time. So too were tons of different folk that could have fit perfectly from a Florida radio station, dance hall, or otherwise from every county alike. But at the end of 1924, OK hadn't focused on any of them at all, or even jazz at all, instead going for a different genre of music too. Whether they had heard of them through a James Polk connection to Tampa Bay, had seen them perform out of state and their tremendous success, or maybe because they saw their Cornette Wanted ad in the December 27th issue of the Billboard, they decided to focus upon the Royal Scotch Highlanders Band of St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, or St. Pete as we call it, was in a boom by 1924. It was a major tourist city. Apart from the city's sunny weather and beaches, it featured many sunny attractions such as its often talked about green benches, many top-notch golf courses, lawn bowling, the largest shuffleboarding court around, fishing, parks, pier, and many other amenities that made it such a popular tourist trap. By the 20s, it had earned the nickname the Sunshine City, and the well-established Royal Scotch Highlanders band that played in Williams Park downtown was just the cherry on top. The band, led by Roy D. Smith, sometimes known as Bob Smith, had a 28-piece Scottish Highland Orchestra complete with featured vocalists including Scottish tenor Bobby Brawlier, whose quality was compared to Harry Lauder, soprano Miss Dora Hilton, whistling bird imitator Harold Stockton, master xylophonist Melvin McGregor, harmonica player Fred K. Monroe, and harpsichordist John Laletta, among others. A considerable amount of these musicians were multi-instrumentalists, doublers or triplers, if not more. That summer, they were on a tour through Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Texas, Iowa, Washington, and Toronto, playing at the National Realtors Association in Washington, Iowa State Fair, 
and the National Rotarian Convention in Toronto. Despite them performing internationally and commonly being outside of Florida, since the late 1900s, they had been doing 18-week-long winter engagements in St. Pete and becoming a featured attraction. Tens of thousands have heard them play in Florida and plenty of others out of state. The St. Petersburg City of Commerce gave them their own Pullman train, custom furnished for them, affectionately named Sunshine. The band by itself was a massive advertisement for the Sunshine City. I could easily fill up the rest of this video harping on about their accomplishments. So by early January of 1925, OK decided Roy Smith's band was the perfect candidate. Contracting and negotiating, likely by phone or by telegram, with him to record his band. Evidently, Roy or OK themselves wanted the soloists in the band to feature over record in one way or another. As 24 sides total were intended to be cut by OK featuring the band or their soloists. Now, time to get down there. The trek from General Phonograph in New York City to St. Petersburg is roughly 1,000 miles. It was said to be the furthest they had ever went out to record from New York, and it was reported to be the first records ever made in Florida. And as far as I've researched discographically, this appears to be true, and it seems that no one has even attempted to dispute it. So they sent down a recording crew of three, including recording director Ralph Peer, technical director Charles Hibbert, and field representative George Jeffers. Peer had already been with OK for a while, recording with many artists including Fiddle and John Carson since 1923, and is considered by today's standards to be one of the most notable recording engineers in fields of country and blues. Hibbert was said to be one of the top recording engineers of the entire phonographic trade by this point. Not only was he second in importance to Otto Heinemann, but he probably wouldn't have came to the session if it weren't for him wanting to see Florida himself. He brought along his wife and daughter with him. Jeffers was the newest to OK of the three. A sales representative, probably with strong tie at the Polk, and his job while he was down here was probably to coordinate with local sellers and distributors, all of them likely coming by train, along with the recording equipment. They arrived on the night of Monday the 12th in St. Petersburg, and it appears they all stayed at the Hotel Detroit and Sereno Hotel during this time. The Hibbert family would likely take in the sights while Charles recorded along with Ralph Peer. Roy D. Smith and his band. George Jeffers doubtlessly spent most of the time with Hibbard Peer and the band as well. At this point, I'd like to say that in my experience, outside of the most crucial New York, Richmond, and Chicago recordings, we rarely know this much about the specifics of the recordings. But since this was the first recordings ever made in the state of Florida, especially with a popular band and taking place in a booming town, the news definitely kept an eye and a few reporters on it. But this is just scratching the surface of all that happened here. So on to the recording itself. It started out with a search for an area that could be made into a recording studio. The idea was to find an empty storeroom. It needed to be someplace in town that the streetcars weren't near, as the vibration could screw up the recording either audibly or through vibration. It had to be somewhere no taller than 12 feet on the inside, and it had to be echoless. Eventually, two areas like this was found at a Central Avenue mortgage and insurance company named Baynard & Thorn Inc., and at a vacant building on 7th and 9th Street, where a grocer named Cobble and Osborne was at until the summer of 1924, before it appears they moved or went out of business. Seemingly half of these records would be made at both places, with OKs at Baynard & Thorn first, along with the former Cobble and Osborne second with Sunshine. It was decided that 24 sides would be made, spread across 12 records. All songs picked to be made were popular requests by locals and audiences for the band to play. That being over a five-day period starting on Wednesday, January the 14th, and ending on Monday, January 19th. That gives them at least four days if they take Sunday off, and it appears they did. On Wednesday, Coconut Dance was the first side to be recorded, along with probably another. On the 15th, two sides, Divertisement Espanol and La Paloma, were finished by about noon. On the 16th, the recording team attended a dinner party at the Hotel Sereno, dancing to a Meyer Davis orchestra, along with the Hibbard family and others. The Highlanders' records would be made in the mornings, as the band played shows in the afternoon. During these recordings, a photo was taken of the session to be made into posters for OK Advertising. It appears none of these have surfaced to date, yet the St. Petersburg Time used the photo as we see here. 
Yes, this was 1925, but this was still the age of acoustical recording. Apart from autograph and some other smaller ventures, it wouldn't be until later in the year that Columbia, Victor, Brunswick, and others started going electrical themselves. Even then, OK wouldn't record electrically until after that. Ralph Peer explained to the press the details of the recording process. When the players come in, they will be allowed to take whatever position they want. They will see nothing but a curtain with four horns sticking out of it. These four horns are attached to a central recording machine behind the curtain. Why the curtain? Experience has taught us that it is impossible to keep the players watching the director if they can see the recording machine. On this machine is a wax record and a sapphire needle. The selection is played by the band, causing the sound waves to hit the diaphragm of the recording machine, which causes the stylus to vibrate, which in turn causes the sapphire to make a zigzagging path across the record. When this is done, the record is played. It is played for the benefit of Charles L. Hibbert, the recording engineer. He listens intently to the record, and though it may sound fine to the rest of us, it may not be to him. He will know by it just what is to be featured, just what instrument needs to be brought closer to the horns. That choice is made after Mr. Hibbert decided which instrument should predominate. After this is done, the first impression on the wax record is shaved off, leaving the surface smooth, and the piece is played again. Then the selection is played once more for the wax record, but the record is not played. It has become something too precious to bother. It is what is called the master record, for it has on it the impression which is to be transferred to the celluloid disc, which are eventually to reach the public. The process of making records from the master record requires seven days. When all was said and done, they recorded 12 sides, all by the Highlander themselves it seems, all of which being instrumentals too. Only 8 of these sides would be coupled together onto OK for release, all on their 40,000 series. Those being The Nightingale and the Frog, The Woodlark, The Cuckoo and Frog, Coconut Dance, The Virginia Skedaddle, Old Timer's Waltz, La Paloma, Forget Me Not, and The Glad Girl. There were several other songs made such as Divertisement Espanol, The Sunny South, Joy to the World, and Songs of Scotland, the last two being recorded on the 19th. Hayward would say that of them all, Songs of Scotland were the best. Whether this is a statement of musical quality or recording quality isn't known, and it can't be observed today, as Divertisement, Sunny South, and Songs of Scotland, among several others, weren't ever released. From what's gathered here, it looks like it was probably two to four songs completed per day. Doesn't sound like much, but with only four or five hours to work with, plus having to account for the possible bad takes as well as the foregoing process explained, it makes sense why so few then. All of these appear to only be on OK itself, but considering the talk of distributors internationally in Europe and Canada and Africa among other places, perhaps some of these made it onto Odeon, just not identified as in making this video. While the OK records were completed, there was still more to be done. Peer and Hibbard weren't recording just for the sake of OK. The Sunshine Phonograph and Record Co. was founded around this time. A venture by Roy Smith, his sister Nellie, and surely also George Jeffers. The label would feature more of the Royal Scotch Highlanders band along with its soloists. Recordings for this label would be from about the 20th through the 23rd, when it was reported they were completed. The first record being by the Royal Scotch Grenadiers band, which is either pseudonymous in origin or a band in a band augmentation. If the latter is true, it is probably this saxophone octet reported on in early January, including Stockton and Brawlier. Most Sunshine sides focused on the soloist of Roy Smith's band. There had been a change of soloists since late 1924. Brawlier and Stockton were still there, but Melvin McGregor and John Loletta appear to have left the band. It appears the Dora Hilton wasn't present for any of these recordings. Maybe there was one or two sides planned for her, but nothing ever came of this. Brawlier would be the only singer in the band. Recording Tobermory and Bella the Bella de Noon, two sides that Harry Lauder composed and also recorded. Harold Stockton made bird imitations while also conventionally whistling tunes like a songbird. Fred K. Monroe played harmonica on the side fooling around, though it was also planned for him to play harp but evidently nothing came from this. The label itself is a very stunning and memorable design. A velvety red background with a strongly pronounced gold text in design, showing the outline of the sun peaking halfway above the ocean's horizon. 
near the center having a ship or perhaps the Egmont Key Lighthouse, and the landscape surrounding it showing palm trees on land, while rays of light that demand their own attention spread across the full scene, with the name Sunshine Records riding the rays. The bottom half of the label being for displaying basic info such as producer name, location, artist, and sometimes composer credits, as well as the fact that these records were recorded in St. Petersburg to advertise the city. They chose to label the record as number along with an A and B indicator instead of a conventional series block given. Except for this first record being 12 inches, all of these Sunshine releases would be regular 10 inch shellac couplings. Numbers 1 through 5 being Joy to the World, coupled with Echoes from the Metropolitan Opera House, followed by Brawlier's Two Sides on Two. Fred Monroe and Harold Stockton would be coupled with Foolin' Around and Bird Imitations on Three. The Nightingale and the Frog and the Woodlark, Cuckoo and the Frog by the Highlanders themselves would make up four, along with Coconut Dance and Virginia Skedaddle also from OK making up five. Though this wouldn't be all of the recordings either, one other label still was created during this time, being known as Scott Records, made by Say Scott, manager and head of the nearby Scott Music Company down the street from Baynard and Thorne, which had made success over the last year or so by furnishing homes with pianos, phonographs, sheet music, and, as the ad say, everything musical. They were an Edison record and phono supplier, while being a Baldwin piano supplier. Many knew Scott in the city, and he was a popular baritone singer. He likely got in contact with George Jeffers while he was down here and made a deal with OK to make his label. The press likely had no knowledge of this as no one ever mentioned this label ever in print. Only two sides were made on it and without the Highlanders. Scott would sing that sweet story of old and on the flip side it would be One Sweetly Solemn Thought by fellow baritone Earl B. Renwick who seemed to be working on the same street but at the first security bond and mortgage company as a joint manager if this 1923 ad still holds up by then. There is little doubt that Renwick and Scott knew each other personally and Scott recognized the potential for the recording. Both sides feature piano accompaniment by one George R. Henninger, a pianist, organist, and composer from New York who had come down for an engagement in late 1924 as the city's Plaza Theater had hired him to play their organ. During this time, Say and George played together at the local Rotarian Club in which George played some of his own work. By this point in 1925, he had his own orchestra at the nearby Poinsietta Hotel. If this wasn't enough to make Henninger more than qualified, he was the pianist for the trial recording of tenor singer Charles Dittmer for Victor that last September and even before then, around 1922, recording a single-sided record with Suzanne France for Electric Recording Laboratories. So the three of them realistically recorded both sides with Hibbert and Peer at the same time at the Sunshine Records, probably in one afternoon after the Highlanders had left, bringing in a piano from Scott Music Company down the street, spending an hour or so on it, and then calling it a day. For Scott Records, it's so obscure that not even a label picture has come up yet. The one can imagine they would be similar in appearance to Sunshine, but likely with a much more simpler design. Scott's purpose was likely just to advertise the music company and never anything more. By now, all the masters of these records were made. So sometime in the week of the 23rd, Charles Hibbard, George Jeffers, and Ralph Peer would leave St. Petersburg and go back to New York to create the records themselves. Several time frames were reported being between a week and two weeks for said records to be made and available. All previously mentioned exclusion of songs and ways of couplings for these releases were likely decided at their general phonograph discovery. By early February, Hibbert and Peer would tell the talking machine world that they were delighted as to the results of these records, and the sales of the Highlander 78s would judge whether or not more records of them would be made in the future. As the months went on, Preparations were made by Nellie and Roy Smith to make an actual shop for Sunshine Records. Orders would be placed for the Highlanders records, 1,000 per six released, six possibly indicating some combination of the OK and Sunshine Records made, as by following catalog numbers, some OK releases of them were made several hundred after the last, making a considerable amount of time after passing, perhaps the majority being Sunshine while one or two being OK. What makes this seem likely is that the OK advertisements for their Sunshine releases would begin in March, while the 6,000 total records ordered arrived by the end of February. 
though samples had been received closer to the beginning of the month and were enjoyed by the Highlanders themselves. When Scott Mew the company got their records, and in what quantity will likely never be known, though they probably had theirs by no later than April, by the start of March, the Smith had found a sustainable area for their shop, being further down the same road as Baynard and Thorne, Scott Mew the company, First Security Bond and Mortgage, and the Hotel Poinsietta, all of which being on Central Avenue. Though it wasn't just records that they had received, it appears Roy Smith, along with Jeffers, organized likely with James Polk to make a custom portable sunshine suitcase phonograph model, which would be available in the shop along with at Scott Me the Company, the Harry Thornburg Newsstand, Pierce Drug Co., the Prather Strickland Drug Co., Progressive Drug Co., and the St. Petersburg Radio Shop. Ads of this were made, along with a one-week offer to get a machine along with the choice of two records to go with it. Highlanders and perhaps Scott Records would be their only options for $25, stating that they had a limited amount of machines themselves. By the end of March and early April, for Sunshine itself, it appears that all of the Sunshine and OK Records were released and made available to the public. Same with the Scott Record too, probably. Smith noted on March 21st that 9 out of 10 Sunshine 78s sold were packed and shipped somewhere probably to more northern parts of the United States, advertising St. Petersburg. An offer of all five Sunshine records for $4 appeared later. But after April, there seems to be no more mentions of Sunshine anywhere. An April 12th article about the Highlanders say that their record sold very good, collaborating Smith's prior point, but not specifying which label. Probably by this point, Sunshine Records had sold all of its stock, phonographs, and five releases until there were either too few for it to be worth selling or none at all and the label went out of business around May of 1925, not ordering any more inventory because it fulfilled its purpose. It was an advertisement after all. By the end of April, the Royal Scotch Highlanders packed up for a trip to Houston, Texas, taking their Sunshine Pullman coach with them, likely also taking a few dozen Sunshine 78s with them for a promotion, as they started performing across the country again, starting and ending winter seasons in St. Petersburg for the next few years. Hibbert and Pierce said that the success of those 1925 recordings would determine if they would record the Highlanders again. Despite local sales, it wasn't enough for OK to record them again, and it seems to be the case for every other artist on Sunshine. The Highlanders would eventually sign a contract to make Miami their new winter season spot in 1928, making St. Pete and the Williams Park band shell no longer their main spot. Their Sunshine City Pullman car would be refurnished to fit Miami, and the band would start playing over radio a bit too. Their Sunshine and OK releases would be something to brag about, but apart from their own personal copies that each member doubtlessly had at least one record of, it would fade from time. In 1931, Roy's daughter Virginia would star in the movie The Girl Habit, and nearly a year later the band would play North Carolina's State Fair in October of 1932. Almost an exact year after that, Roy Smith would die in Ohio, having left for the North beforehand, the band probably breaking up after he left. As for Smith's sidemen themselves, some got prosperous careers. Bobby Brawlier stayed with the band up until the early 30s, about the time of its breakup. In 1937, he took over a failing trailer park venture started in nearby Bradenton the year prior, and by 1954 had shaped it into what was called the largest trailer park in the world at the time with over 1,000 trailers and a small city of residents. His profits by then financing the building of the Memorial Hospital, various clubs, and youth centers. Retiring a few years later and becoming the treasurer of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints until his death in 1973. John Joseph Haney, the band's xylophonist along with his saxophonist brother Edward, would join the legendary John Philip Sousa and his band in 1926. Edward convincing Sousa to bring aboard bass saxophone and harmonica player Fred K. Monroe too. Martin O'Connor, another Highlanders member, would join Sousa's band at some point too. Supposedly, Monroe, because of his unique harmonica playing skills, was the only one that Sousa let play in his band. After Sousa died in 1932, Monroe traveled north and led several bands of his own in Evansville, Indiana, playing concerts and also leading a dance band after World War II, playing for several organizations including Oakland City's high school band up until his 1960 death. 
Also after Susan died, former Highlander Edward Haney, who had his own concert band after the Highlanders, and flutist Joseph Lefter, played a few Williams Park St. Petersburg engagements, one of which being a Coast Guard history program, in which they shared a stage with Harold Stockton. The whistling bird imitator and banjoist initially stayed in St. Petersburg, but had perhaps the most intriguing change in careers of them all. Leaving the band in April of 1925 to join the Collins Detective Agency in town, and later the city's police department. During these times he made a few arrests, found two Philadelphia boys that had been missing for months, and still found uses for his stage talents. By 1930 though, he had left St. Petersburg for his Knightstown, Indiana home, playing in churches around Greenfield and Knightstown for a while, though leaving for the south again with a wife in tow. Traveling back occasionally to St. Petersburg before eventually settling down there and raising a son, Raymond, who would later fight in Korea in 1952. In 1957, he got in contact with Brawlier again, surely bringing up the old days in Sunshine, before moving to Tombstone, Arizona by 1959, passing away some years later. As for the folk involved in Scott Records, they went onward themselves. Say Scott would go on to run his music company well. By the end of summer 1925, it became one of the regional sellers for Columbia 78s by Earl Gresh's orchestra. Gresh having left the Coliseum and forming a band at the Gangplank in town, Scott Music Company would continue selling Edison line products as well as furnishing houses with pianos, phonographs, and even selling tickets for local shows for years to come. Scott also performing a fair share of his own shows in theaters, dinners, 4th of July events, arranging a vocal quartet, and playing a large spot for the massive Orange Band and American Legion, playing over the radio, to the degree of even getting an NBC WSUN spot in the early 30s too. The Scott Music Company changed location at the beginning of 1926, and the furthest I was able to find on it being in business is as late as 1973. But try as I might, I can't find an obituary for him, but he likely died in the last 40 years. Henninger went on to lead a band and stayed in the Florida area throughout the 20s, playing similar events as how the ex-Highlanders members did, playing with Monroe and Edward Haney in the early 30s. By 1932, having a full 15-piece orchestra playing over WSUN. By 1933, he would start musical work for movies, composing for Playthings of Desire, aka Murder in the Library, Hired Wife, and Chloe Love is Calling You, both in 1934. Coming back to New York in 1936, and apart from the Highlanders members who went with Suda, he would become the only other person from the story to record once more. That being over Decca in 1937, and the pianist backing the Irish tenor William Kennedy for one record. Hear the bloom of that valley shall fade from my heart. By then, still composing as he did into the 40s with songs like When I'm With You, Old Prairie Wagon, Old Sunset Lullaby, and Dream Girl of Theta Chi along with Sammy Kay, which is said to still be sung by the Theta Chi College Fraternity today. He did a fair bit of radio and TV work for shows Ladies Be Seated, Ethel and Albert, and the Boris Karloff Mystery Playhouse until his 1953 death. Lastly, Earl Renwick would continue in real estate for a bit before becoming a St. Pete City Commissioner later in 1925. Apart from buying several properties here, he would study music in Boston, New York, and Milan, Italy, eventually relocating in Maine by 1929, which became his summer home while frequenting St. Pete. His success was mostly on stage, associating with the American Opera Company of Chicago, but playing many a show at the Lakewood Theater in Maine and becoming a singing director for the Universalist Church, Augustus YMCA, and others playing in Europe too. By the age, he would eventually narrow it back down to St. Petersburg and Portland, Maine. In 1935, while down here, he sang at the Shrine Club with George Henninger. By 1960, Renwick had raised a full family of four kids and eight grandkids, at which point he decided to try politics again, this time in Maine by running for Senate. He didn't win soon after retiring and dying in 1972. For the trio of recording engineers, they would all return to their job at OK, recording in Atlanta, St. Louis, Detroit, New Orleans, or wherever else OK needed to record and organize sales. Charles Hibbard returned to OK as technical director up until 1929, recording many artists during that time, 
but perhaps best remembered for his work recording Mammy Smith and Louis Armstrong records and his crucial innovations in recording technology. He would die in 1933. George Jeffers continued throughout 1925, attending more folk music sessions with Peer and eventually marrying his sister Anita Peer, which made Ralph Jeffers' brother-in-law. Seemingly by the end of 1925, leaving OK. By 1928, he was associating with the Philadelphia branch of Victor Distribution. As for Peer himself, as 1925 continued, the era of electrical recording had begun, as both Victor and Columbia began recording electrically using their modifications of Western electric technology. Acoustic recording now had a serious rival. OK's answer to this was Hibbard's innovative True Tone process, which they unveiled in January of 1926, which rivaled Columbia's phenomenal Viva Tonal process, arguably sounding better. But due to disagreements with Otto Heinemann and overall Columbia managerial encroachment, Peer would resign in February, going to Victor in 1926, where he would continue recording with dozens more artists such as Margaret Johnson, the New Orleans Blue Five, Benny Moten, Fats Waller, Lloyd Scott, Bobby Leakin, Blind Billy McTell, and Jimmy Rogers just to name a few. Being the main engineer involved in the famous Bristol Sessions in 1927 too. OK eventually merging with Columbia by the end of 1926, abandoning True Tone for Viva Tonal, putting an end to the General Phonograph Corporation, and that turned into the OK Phonograph Corporation. By the time of his 1960 passing, he had built up an unmistakably important career in the world of recorded sound, and his name is still referenced in the world of American country and folk music today. The Sunshine City herself has changed many times over the years, out with the old, in with the new type gentrification becoming clearer by the day. Central Avenue, where most of Sunshine's story takes place, has lost most everything from them. The Sunshine Phonograph and Record Co.'s building is long gone. They put a BB&T skyscraper over that block and a shorter one beside it. Nearby, the old areas that housed the Scott Music Company and the Pierce Drug Co. a block away was destroyed, along with the rest of the block. A park was put over top of it, but was recently leveled, so now the biggest condo high-rise in the west coast of Florida is being built there. Where Harry Thornburg's newsstand was is not known, apart from being perhaps outside the Snell Arcade building since ads shows that they're in 1917. Perhaps on the sidewalk where the 1928 Rutland building rests now over top of it. Locating where the Progressive Drug Co. was is just as unlikely. A neighborhood is where the St. Petersburg radio shop is now. The only places in the Sunshine Story that still exist is where Prather Strickland was, in the vacant corner building on 7th and 9th Street. Though many businesses have since occupied both, the shape and designs are pretty much intact. As for Williams Park, where the Royal Scotch Highlanders played, had its band show replaced with a stage made in 1954 where now it has proposed care plans with a budget of $1.5 million to renovate it. The park itself has also become a gathering ground for the homeless. The Coliseum still stands intact despite interior renovation. Band leader Earl Gresh in later years made a half museum workshop and gift shop in a beautiful English cottage style building called Earl Gresh's Wood Parade. It survived relatively intact over the decades since it opened in 1940 with many restaurants being made from it. In recent years, a brewery and restaurant named Sesh brought the property and is currently restoring it from years of aging. The owner, Matthew Powers, planned to make his pub a testament to Gresh's memory. It opened last week to much success, unlike one building where half the stuff was recorded. Leonard and Thorne is long gone. What is now the Sable Lodge is also an insurance group as well. Uh, just like them. Maybe there's a connection, maybe there isn't, but there's nothing that remains of Sunshine Records or what OK Records did back in 1925. Except for a mural that's on the side of this building here where it once was. Right over there where that island was is probably where the actual recordings took place. The Royal Scotch Highlander Band was actually set up and here and Gerard and the others were all recording right there. 
considering that you sat right next to a, an open window right there, but it's all gone now, so we'll never know really. This entire building has been wiped away, and all it's left is the actual original sidewalk and still stands. This stuff is everywhere all across town. You can still find it to this day. One day soon, though, nearly everything from the days of when General Phonograph came to the Sunshine City will be gone or unrecognizable. Sunshine and Scott records themselves have remained elusive for nearly a century since creation. The few collectors who know of it and don't confuse it with some of the other Sunshine labels, unless they're Floridian, they probably haven't cared much to look into it any farther than just the label. Scotch tenors, whistlers, and similar things, while still being quite interesting musically, aren't exactly the most sought after 78s. As for Odeon, it appears the Royal Scotch Highlanders never got on there, but around 1926, Parlophone had four sides of Sunshine and OK Scotch Highlander 78s re-released on their E3000 series block. Whether these carry the recording St. Petersburg phrase or not is unknown, and none have surfaced online. The only time it appears Sunshine was spoken of since 1925 was by Carl Kenziora in Record Changer magazine, reprinted in Record Research in 1987. Carl dates through a comparison that they were recorded in January of 25. In 1953, Harold Stockton's son gave WTSP disc jockey Glenn Dill a copy of a record claimed to be from a 1918 Williams Park concert in Harold's collection. Due to there being no mention or evidence of a recording session in 1918 obtainable, I assume this is simply a mistake on someone's part, and that it's truly from 1925, being the only Sunshine record that Stockton was featured on. When Ross Laird and Brian Russ put together the OK Records discography in 2004, they decided to classify Sunshine as a special or private recording released, along with Scott, which it seems they only found out about from OK Ledgers. Probably the same for Sunshine. While it's true that these were essentially privately recorded for a select market, considering that an actual business came from Sunshine which extended into the world of phonographs, maybe it's time to reclassify Sunshine to be a subsidiary of OK? Apart from the St. Petersburg Times, there's been no reference anywhere to Sunshine phonographs, and I haven't been able to find any locally or any online mentions, so it's no surprise that Laird and Rust didn't factor this in 18 years ago. Apart from the main companies and labels, phonograph manufacturers were many back then, and many of them are as obscure as this, if not more so. It's possible seeing how rare they are that none exist today, but further investigation is needed. As for Sunshine, only three releases have been visually documented online, all of which you've seen here already. One Sunshine release appeared in the fall 2011 knock record auction for the minimum bid of $3. Audio of four Sunshine 78s have been posted to YouTube then by channel Howard Knapp, who found them himself, which I've used here. Knapp has said in comments that he's writing a book that includes the Royal Scotch Highlanders. Maybe he'll have a section for Sunshine in there. I'm interested to see what comes of it. Hello Howard, if you're watching this. So how rare are Sunshine 78s? Well, basing off the 6,000 figure alone reported in 1925, it's possible that this figure is indicative of all Sunshine records and the Scott record instead. If so, then there was about 1,000 of each release ever made. Maybe Roy Smith got another shipment of a few hundred more out there for touring purposes that gives a few hundred more, but that's only a maybe. Smith said that 9 of 10 records sold were shipped off. With simple math, that means that roughly 100 of the Sunshine discography remained in Florida. But then there's the shellac shortages of World War II, 78s becoming obsolete in the 50s, and just decades of record being thrown away in general that make things worse. Maybe 20 or 30 of each still exist in the state, and that's a guesstimate. Making about 180 in Florida, or hell, maybe the United States as a whole. Probably a handful scattered around Canada and Europe, not to mention Scott, which is thrice as rare, if not five times. It's possible that Sunshine kickstarted the attention for Floridian artists and did volumes of work for possibilities of Southern Territory bands. After the Royal Scotch Highlanders in the winter of 25, Earl Gresh started recording for Columbia in New York. 
There's also Judd Hill's Blue Devils that record for Janet in 1925 as well that was around in the Tampa Bay area. By the end of the year, Blue Steel had also made it down here and recording for Victor's Savannah, Georgia recording studios in 1927, which Peer would oversee. Miami bands Rusty Lux Syncopators and Jack Crawford also recorded there too. Even the blues band, the Jacksonville Trio, which was comprised of black musicians including Sugar Underwood that came from Florida as well. None of these bands were recording in St. Petersburg or in Florida itself, but where location hindered them, doubtless talent scouts made up for them. All aside though, Sunshine was definitely Florida's first label, and without a doubt Florida's first commercial recordings. Something that we can unmistakably identify with and be proud of that achievement. And as long as there's some of those velvet red and gold Sunshine 78s out there, this legacy to Florida's forgotten label and St. Pete's forgotten musical achievements will live on, going all the way back to its name, after one of the most successful cities in the state, then and now. And that's a win for us. Bye. 